Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Tonight, we are continuing our study of the book of Galatians. We are in chapter 3, beginning with verse 23. So please get your Bibles ready, and we'll start right now. Uh, and we did have a little technical issue. Uh, that's why we're running a little behind schedule. So thank you for bearing with us. Why don't you, why don't you say hi to everybody, Brother Cripps? Yeah, see, I'm not going to say the same thing twice. So <laughs> uh, we already went through my uh, uh, introduction or whatever. So uh, uh, what I'll say uh, now is, uh, well, I guess some of it's similar in that I am looking forward to the study, but I'll just keep it short and say hello to everyone in the chat and uh, say that I'm glad to be here. And I'm, uh, uh, I, I'll miss uh, our dear sister, but I'll be glad to hear from uh, Brother Ben tonight. So that, that'll be good. Right. Thank you. And, and uh, further explanation of that, uh, Sister Renee is enjoying um, a birthday celebration out, yeah. out of town with her son, James, uh, yeah. having a real good time. That's why she's not going to be with us tonight. Uh, Brother Ben will be filling in for her to give his commentary on the scriptures. So, Brother Ben, why don't you say hi to everybody? Hi, everyone. How you doing? It's good to be here. Um, I have my stilts on so I can fill in fit those big pants that uh, I'm filling in for Brene, uh, but I'll do my best. Uh, and I also apologize for the technical difficulties because well, I'm doing something extra this time. I'm doing a 4K backup. So as we're streaming, if anything happens, any hiccups, I'll have a, a pristine 4K copy offline that we can upload um, for backup purposes or even if you want to see a 4K version after this uh, live broadcast. So oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. That's a, you continue to uh, find new ways to improve uh, everything. So we are greatly appreciated and really greatly needed. Uh, we, we couldn't do these programs without you and Matthias producing them for us. So uh, um, now uh, we said that sister Renee is not here tonight and Ben is, is uh, filling in for her for, with the commentary. But my question is, um, are, are we replacing Sister Renee? Is, is she replaceable? Is no. It, is it possible that anybody could replace Sister Renee? No. Yeah. No. There's a, you know, they, they say that in business that, you know, don't think too much of yourself because everybody's replaceable. No, that's but, true. But in this, in this case, no, there's only one untwisted sister. You're right. There is no one like her in this big wide world. Yes. No. All right then. So don't worry about that, Ben. You don't need to worry about trying to live up to any expectations. Uh, we want. To, uh, we're happy to get your unique thoughts. You can also wear your own pants. Yeah. <laughs> yeah wear your own pants. You can and, wear your own pants. You're not having to fill her pants. Yeah, Ben. Uh, yeah, and your insights are just as valid as, as uh, mine and Renee's and Cripps. And, uh, and of course, yours will be different. Yours are your own unique uh, thoughts. So I look forward to hearing it. Let's, let's begin now in the KJV, verse 23, chapter 3. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. You guys have a preference on going first? No matter, you want me to alternate? I'm used, I'm used to going second um, with Renee here. So if Ben wants to do that, then uh, so you can read the Amplified. Yeah. All right, Ben. Let, let sure. You, we'll let you start. Go ahead. Okay. And I do have a secret. Uh, I am using the New King James Version behind the scenes, first of all, because it has less uh, archaic words um, like right. mixed. Like betwixt, betwixt, um, yeah. But uh, also too is I like it because it has uh, alternate renderings or alternate uh, where there's a, a textual variation. It'll tell you, hey, this, there's there's different variations of this. So mm. uh, I find sometimes find that helpful. Uh, and I think there are a couple of examples where the new King, the King James in particular, I think is pretty clearly uh, inaccurate in that respect. But I think overall it's the best translation. But I think there um, no no translation is perfect. Uh, except for the original autographs, of course. Right. Um, I thought I would just read a, a quick quote um, that I thought was very helpful uh, and kind of kind of helps me put put me in the frame of mind for understanding 
uh, Galatians, and it, it's 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 a quote from Louis Louis Sperry Schaefer, if you don't mind. It, it's about uh, Galatians twenty two, the previous verse. But I thought I'd read it just to kind of set the uh, the groundwork. Um, and so it's it's pretty brief. Here it is. It says for the for the sole purpose. That pure grace might be exercised toward men, the human family has been placed under the, the divine judicial sentence of sin. It is obviously true that all men are sinners by both nature and practice, but the present divine decree goes far beyond the, this evident state of sinfulness, wherein one might be deemed to be more or less sinful than another. For God has pronounced an equal and absolute sentence of judgment against all, both Jew and Gentile. Men are now, quote unquote, already condemned, per John 3.18. They are, quote unquote, children of disobedience, per Ephesians 2.2. 2. Not on the ground of their own sinfulness, but on the ground of their federal headship in fallen Adam. Men are now judicially reckoned to be in unbelief, according to Romans 11.32. They are under sin, according to Romans 3.9 and Galatians 3.22. And they are guilty, Romans 3.19. Thus, all human merit has been disposed of absolutely and forever. There, and there is no longer the slightest possibility that, because of personal merit, a divine obligation may now exist toward any individual. The sole divine object is thus universally and judicially disposing of all human merit is clearly revealed. Quote, for God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Romans 11.32. Also, but the scripture has concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe, which is Galatians 3.22. So, uh, again, I think that quote was helpful just to say that, of course, we're all condemned uh, because of our own sinfulness, but also because we're all born in Adam. And that's why we need to be born again in Christ as a new creature. And I think that's basically uh, the gist of uh, Paul's argument throughout Galatians um, is that, you know, there's no reforming the flesh. You have to be born again by the spirit. Mm. All right. Thank you. I, I have a question. Uh um, do you know much about Lewis Berry Schaefer? And uh, I don't. Are you are you real confident with his uh, uh, standing in the on the gospel? Oh, absolutely, on the gospel for sure. Um, he's a cr classic free grace uh, 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 preacher, and uh, he's wrote a lot of great works. Um, there's a couple of things I, I found that you know just minor things. I think of his interpretation is. A little different or not i didn't quite see it the same way but yes he is absolutely uh, a great resource if you want commentary on different uh, verses what i think what i think his strength is is that he's great at seeing the big picture and bring bringing in multiple scriptures and and coming up with a like a summarized theme um you know he definitely can do that better than i can and i, I appreciate his work for that reason alone mm. All right. Thank you. I mean, I've heard his name, of course, many times over the years, but I've never delved in to try to try to find out if he's someone that we should be, uh, you know, recommending and endorsing or not. But I'll take your word for it. You're, I know you're capable of scrutinizing it very well. So, uh, Brother Cripps, let me read that verse 23 in the Amplified before you give us your thoughts. Did he give his thoughts on the verse itself? I don't think he did. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. On three twenty, on, on twenty three. Okay. Before faith came, we were kept under the law, under guard by the law, kept for the faith, which would afterward be revealed. Well, I think yes. I think um, absolutely. The law was our schoolmaster. It was to lead us. It, it, it was there for a couple of reasons. One is to keep God's witness in the world with the Jews and protect that witness. Um, it, it, it did a good job keeping evil out and uh, uh, decorruption coming in, even though it. it the Jews did fail. Uh, it it ultimately <laughs> survived enough where Christ could be born um, with uh, under the law um, and the priesthood and things like that were intact. Uh, but I, I do believe that th it was mainly for to show us that God is righteous and man is not, and the law demands righteousness, and, but it is a witness against us because we are not righteous, and that's why we need to be. Uh, that's why. It was our tutor to bring us to Christ, which could provide that righteousness. Uh, the law demanded righteousness; Christ provided it. That's kind of how I see it. Okay. 
All right, Brother Cripps. Uh, uh, I'm hopeful that the um, uh, Amplify is going to be real helpful. I'm optimistic it will, but uh, I think for me, I would need that kind of help on this. So let me read it in the Amplify. Okay. Now, before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, perpetually imprisoned in preparation for the faith that was destined to be revealed. Hmm. Yeah, it's very similar. Uh, just to kind of say it a different way. Um, I think what Ben read kind of pre helped prepare us for this idea. And I would agree uh, with what was being said. Um, so verse 23. So before faith entered, I mean, obviously people had faith. Paul's not saying that faith didn't exist. He, but he's saying that uh, the law was in control. It was everything was about the law, following the law, doing what the law says. And then uh, Jesus came to fulfill the law. And when he did, I, I would agree with Brother Ben in, in saying that he, he brought his own righteousness and imputed that to us. And uh, then we're saved by faith, according, according to the, uh, the Bible and definitely according to Paul. We're saved by faith. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ. What Romans uh, 5 goes on about. Uh, and so then the last part of it, uh, we're shut up unto faith. Now the Amplified talks about it being in like imprisonment. And I would agree, uh, the law is imprisonment. Uh, there are other verses that talk about uh, it being death. I mean, um, so for us, Jesus brought life. He brought us uh, a new life. And uh, with it, uh, faith. So by believing in him, then we, we uh, stand in the grace through faith. Uh, and that was revealed after the fact, is what Paul's saying. All right. Well, um, I could see how uh, this verse could be used against our, the gospel um, by the, the Lord shippers, uh, and the, or let's say the dispensationalists. Uh, okay. saying that there was a time where we were under law, but not, not faith. Now, the, the fact of the matter is, everybody hopefully will understand it and, and believe this, that uh, uh, from Adam and Eve to all the way to present time and all the way into the future until the second coming of Christ, every person has always been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Mm -hmm. No exceptions. No one has ever been saved by their own works, or no one has ever been saved by a combination of faith and works. That's something you need to understand and accept. Um, and that's really one of the main points of this whole book of Galatians. Is it? It's uh, Paul makes sure you understand that way. You cannot mix faith and works together. Otherwise, it's nullified. It has no value. Uh, no saving power in a, in a, a mixed gospel. Uh, so uh, how can we make sense of this? Uh, it's, uh, when I read it, I think it says before faith came. And Cripps, you pointed out with it, the same kind of point I just made that people, there was always faith before. So what do you mean before faith came? The only way that this will make sense to me and, 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 and conform to uh, the gospel and the other scriptures that we trust is I would say, it should, it should say before the faith came, be, be the faith that we have come to understand, the tenets of our, of our Christianity. Oh, good point. Um, and I see, as, I, as I'm looking through here with the Amplify, I look at the NABRE, and that's not helpful, but I'm looking at the Young's Literal. Young's Literal, I don't know if you can pull that up. It's also a, it's kind of a fourth uh, column I've started now. But Young's Literal says this, and before the coming of the faith. So uh, Young's Literal is um, sometimes it's quite confusing because uh, when, you, when you translate one word at a time, literally, and you're on, sometimes the order and everything is kind of confusing. It's, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, but in this case, it's, it, to me, it's it's perfect way of understanding. Before the coming of the faith, the faith is is our faith. What is your faith, Crips? Ben? Faith. Tell, tell me about your faith. Yeah. 
Yeah, the, the tenets of, of your faith in, in Christ. That's what we're talking about. Not we're, we're not talking about the concept of the uh, you know faith compared to works. Agreed. Um, so, and then it says, under law, we were being kept shut up to the faith uh, about to be revealed. So, in other words, this before that, uh, before the faith was revealed, uh, they were trying to follow the law. Yeah. Or it wouldn't work. Uh, and then finally it was revealed that, wait a second, uh, the, the law is just a schoolmaster to teach you about this new faith that you need to embrace, faith in, in Christ as the so solution to the problem. Also, Luke, uh, excellent point. Um, I, and I, I totally agree with that. Another way of looking at this, too, where Paul says um, the, the law kept us under uh, a, a tutor. The tutor, word for tutor is pedagogos, which I think basically means child trainer. And it, when he says to bring us, I think he's referring to bring us as not not Gentile, but because he's contrasting the Gentile faith, essentially, and the, and the Jewish uh, law. I think when he says bring us, he's saying, I think he could possibly could be saying uh, us as a Jews, because only the Jews got the law. And it was really designed to show them uh, to get you to cry out for mercy. In fact, if you look all throughout scripture, um, God rescued his people when they cried out to him. Like, like for example, in uh, Exodus, they cried out to God under he they're in heavy bondage, which is a loose to the law. And if they finally cried out to the Lord. And that's when he rescued them. Um, in the end times, I believe all when all Israel will be, will be saved, they also will cry out to him, uh, and that's when he will rescue them. And um, I also believe that's how it teaches us as children uh, under the law is that when I again when I didn't understand the difference between law and grace, I uh, read the law. It taught me about God's righteousness, and it, it condemned me. And I finally just cried out to him and said, "I can't do it. I need help. I, I need your mercy." And as soon as that happened the scriptures opened up to me. I started realizing, okay, there is a very clear distinction between law and grace. They don't mix at all. And I started seeing all these things like sort of read scripture kind of like in high definition. Um, again, it, 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 I, in that sense, it was my tutor to show me uh, I, the law can only condemn me. I, I am, there's something wrong with me. There's something fundamentally wrong with me. I am not good. Um, I, I'm not a good person. Um, I, you know, I'm evil. That, that that's a terrifying uh, realization, but at the same time, uh, it was a needed realization for for my uh, salvation, to, for me to realize I'm evil and I need a savior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You do need a savior, Ben. I know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I, I think that is an important point. Uh, I, I, I've said this a hundred times, and I'll probably say it a thousand times before I'm gone. <laughs> but the the law was only given to Israel. It was not given to the Gentile world. The law is is the laws of Moses, and uh, they were uh, um, so people who um, think thought back then that wait uh, the Gentiles have to convert to Judaism and follow the laws of Moses. That was wrong, but throughout history, people have continued to believe this and teach it, so that today. Most Christians we know, even people who understand grace and and uh, believe correctly for the gospel, they still think, though, that somehow uh, the Ten Commandments and the laws of Moses, particularly the Ten Commandments, that they're, they're somehow applied to the Gentile world. But they were never given to Gentiles. Paul says that the law that the Gentiles were under is the law of conscience. And I think that we all got the law of conscience implanted in us and, and genetically. It was passed on uh, through uh, 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 from Adam and Eve. When they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they got a conscience. It's it's the knowledge of good and evil. It's the knowledge of right and wrong. That's mm -hmm. your conscience. And we are all born with a conscience. So that's 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 what we're under. Oh, so amen. what does it mean when it says we were kept under the faith? Well, that's what I'm going to say. Amen, brother Ben. The, he's talking to now about the uh, the Jewish believers here. The Jewish believers are the ones that were kept under the law, not the Gentile believers, when he says we. So I think that's the point you made. Go ahead, Chris. Oh, that's okay. We can move forward. Okay. All right. Any more, Ben? We'll move on if there's nothing else. 
Yep. Move on. Okay, let's go to verse 24 in the KJV. It says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. All right, Chris. Yeah, so, go first. Yeah, so you you mentioned this, Brother Luke, and and uh in the midst of what you're saying, and uh, you can use that word schoolmaster. Uh, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster. It also fits in with Ben, uh, what Ben uh, used the Greek and, and talked about what that word meant in Greek. Um, so yeah, the, this is this is the way things were. The law was our schoolmaster. It was in, when, I, when uh, Paul's saying our, I do believe he is talking about the, the Jewish people. I completely agree with what uh, was said that we're not under uh, the Mosaic law, we never have been, we never should be, but yet there are still groups of people out there today that uh, knowingly uh, go uh, back under the law and uh, cast grace aside, uh, and they cast Paul aside. That's a story for another night, of course, but they, uh, in order to, to make the Bible say what they needed to say in order to get other people to go under the law, you have to remove Paul completely out of the Bible, and that's what they try to do. Um, interestingly enough, though, this the particular verse ends with the sentence that we might be justified by faith, which, you know, the, the cool thing about memorizing scripture is when you have it memorized and you come across another verse that's similar, it pops right up in your mind. And so this one for me, uh, Romans 5, 1, uh, therefore being justified by faith. So he's said the same thing to the Romans. Now he's saying, uh, uh, saying it to the church in Galatia. But this concept is not new for Paul. It's not new for us either that we might be justified by faith. That's how we're justified. That's the mechanism of faith uh, or justification rather is is by faith in, in, in Christ. He doesn't say it here, but it certainly is implied. Um, but the point is the schoolmaster, he's following up verse 23 with verse uh, uh, 24 and calling it a schoolmaster. He's still talking about the law here, but he's also talking about uh the, the part that uh, faith plays uh, in it now, as opposed to back then. Okay, all right, thank you, brother. Uh, brother Ben, would you like me to read the Amplified first, or you just want to go ahead? Uh, sure, go ahead and do the Amplified. Okay, verse 24 in the Amplified reads, uh, with the result that the law has become our tutor, and our disciplinarian to guide us to Christ so that we may be justified, that is declared free of the guilt of sin and its penalty and placed in right standing with God by faith. Yeah, Luke, uh, you said before, um, you, you made a point to call this verse out and I, I love that you did and it stuck with me and uh, I found it and it was very clear in scripture that it stuck out like a sore thumb. And that was, and I'm quoting uh, not verbatim, I'm just being, uh, uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but it says, uh, you must obey all my laws so that it will be well with you in the land. It's nothing, it was, it never said anything about ever about eternal life. It was just about being well with you in the land so you wouldn't um, suffer the consequences of, of sin uh and uh some of the consequences of being chastised like like israel was when they were um brought into captivity and whatnot um in fact i i believe that you know israel is basically a, a picture of uh the, uh the flesh essentially um and uh even a believing uh, in the flesh uh the carnal nature of, of a man where you can be obedient and uh as a believer and uh reap rewards and uh, prosperity um and I don't mean physical prosperity necessarily. I mean spiritual prosperity um, or uh, not be obedient and, and receive the hand of uh, chastisement. Uh, and I believe that's what the captivity was for. Uh, that's what, what that's what it was about when they wandered the wilderness for 40 years. Um, in fact, if you read uh, Exodus, they said that all Israel worshiped God uh, soon after the uh, after the um, escape. The Exodus, they they were all all Israel worshipped God, but it wasn't long after that they became disobedient. Uh, not only with the golden calf incident, but repeatedly, and it culminated in uh, them failing to heed uh, the voices of Caleb and Joshua about uh, uh, and, and actually heeding the voices of the uh, the evil report that was discouraging and told them, no, it, it, it's too much, we can't do it. The land is full of uh, 
it, it devours its inhabitants. And so I believe those people were, were, were believers at one point, but they became uh, disobedient in practice and they suffered God's consequences. Again, they were, they're not pictures of people who couldn't, I don't believe Israel is a picture of heaven. I believe pictures is, is, a, is a Israel, the promised land was a picture of entering God's daily rest. Um, and I say all that because, um, uh, again, the law could, could, could not uh, grant justification. And, and when you see the word justification, that's always linked, I be, well, m nearly always linked with, with eternal life. And um, the law could not provide that justification. It demanded righteousness. It could not provide righteousness. That's why faith through, in Christ does grant eternal life. It does grant justification. It's a one-time uh, eternal uh, courtroom justification. It's, it's a declaration of God that you're uh, righteous. There's no law that can be held against you. And that's, uh, it, you can only get that through faith in Christ. Amen. I would like to, before uh, you go, Brother Luke, I just want to add one thing because I thought uh, Ben slipped a point in there that I wanted to point out. Uh, the the He I think that looking at the Hebrew people also shows us what the law does uh, to people. Uh, if we look at how they uh, continue to have trouble following the law, it, it should A, show us what it's like to be under the law, and B, show us that it's impossible to follow, that we can't follow it. And I yeah. believe there, there are plenty of stories about the, the, the heavy hitters. Well, I always call them heavy hitters in the Bible. Uh, that came out of the Hebrew people that continually failed to be able to follow the law. Even David, people hold David up as this great guy. He was a great guy. Don't get me wrong. But he messed up big time, messed up. If you want to make a comparison, he messed up a lot, a lot more than all of us, uh, unless we've murdered someone and took their wife and had a baby with her. Unless we've done that, if you're making a comparison. But yet he was a man after God's own heart. So uh, I loved your point, Ben, and I completely agree. I'm just uh, trying to add this idea to it that it shows us several things. It shows us many things, and uh, I believe they're provided for us to be able to see the uh, how the Hebrew people reacted to the law. First, they said they were going to do it. Yeah, we're going to do everything you tell us, God. And then not too long after that, they're already messing up. I mean, they just can't do it. That's why Jesus was sent in the first place. Yeah, excellent point. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, then. Um, now, I would ask the chat room, um, if you have, want to make a comment or a question that's relevant to the subject, put it in all caps so that we you, know, you bring it to my attention. But I, I've been looking and seeing that you've you're got some interesting thoughts here, and I, I want to respond. Um You've, you've mentioned uh, Ray Comfort, uh, MacArthur, uh, Olstein, and so on, but I'm going to focus on uh, Ray Comfort. You know that Ray Comfort and Kirk Cameron, they famously developed a, a system of, of evangelism they call the Way of the Master. And uh, they, they, they put forth the idea that uh, this is the way that Jesus did his uh, gospel message. You know, he would go through the Ten Commandments with, with people, uh, like when he was talking to the rich young ruler and, and uh, reviewing the commandments and asked him if he kept them. Uh, uh, but so they would routinely ask people, well, did you ever tell a lie? Did you ever steal something, even something a little small? And, and uh, to get people to admit that they've uh, done these things wrong. Um, I, I am very, very familiar with their system of evangelism. And it doesn't really bother me uh, so much what they do until they get to the end. Um, if we want to use the Ten Commandments to convict someone uh, so they understand their need for the Savior, that's what this verse is really telling us. As the verse 24 says, Wherefore the law, this is pr pr primarily talking about the, the moral law, the Ten Commandments, was our schoolmaster. So when we examine ourselves, look in a mirror to, to, to see if we have uh, broken any of these Ten Commandments, we'll see there's blemishes all over our, all over our face. Um, but um, uh, so we, we've 
that should be our school bus, our teacher, uh, the, um, our tutor, as it says in all these translations. It, it should the law should reveal to us our sinfulness and therefore recognize our need for the Savior. Uh, so it, it can be used that way appropriately, uh, but the problem with the way of the master is that the, what they ask a person to do as, an, as a solution yeah. is repent of all their sins and change their life, get sin out of their life, then believe in Jesus. It's focused on so, sin, Brother Luke, right? I mean, he's, fo he's focusing on their sin. And that's, yeah. that's a great way to get people to realize they need a Savior, but then where's the follow-up? The follow-up is, as you're saying, or, you know, re re you know, repent all your sin. And that's a daily thing for them. That, that's that, It's not one and done. It's a daily thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I uh, when I first saw Ray Comfort's um, program on TV, um, that's what inspired me to go out, and I tried to do the same thing he was doing. I got a camera, and I filled out a little questionnaire, and I would ask people if I could interview them. And, and, and I would told them, I'm going to send this interview into this television program, and maybe you'll be on TV. And that was my intention. Uh, uh, but uh, and I went through the same kind of a system. Of course, I didn't tell them the solution is to repent of their sin, though. But I did uh, ask them if they've you know, ever told a lie, ever uh, you know, uh, stolen something, and so on. And uh, so I did use that method. Uh, but I remember Bible Jim, he had a real problem with that. Bible Jim is one of the leaders of the, like the street preachers of America. And he didn't like people using the Ten Commandments. And I, I eventually ended up agreeing that um, when we use the Ten Commandments, uh, it's very easy then for people to make the, make the mistake that thinking that, well, we are under the Ten Commandments, when, when in fact we are not. Uh, that only the Jews were under those Ten Commandments. So in that way, it's not really the, the best thing to do because it sets us up for um, a system of faith plus works. Okay, now, yeah, believe in Jesus, but still, what about those commandments? They, they still think that they've got to now follow the commandments. Yeah. But uh, so what he did, and, and I eventually um, uh, modified my methods to conform to it, and, and rather than referencing Ten Commandments, uh, I, I would just say, did you ever, um, did you ever do anything wrong? Can you, can, did you, can you ever admit that you've ever done any sins? And most people are going to say, oh, of course I've sinned. But you're going to encounter somebody once in a while that says, no, I've never sinned. Uh, and then if they say they've never sinned, then we can say, well, did you ever tell a lie? But connecting it as, well, this is one of the commandments of Moses, that's where I think we're just, we're, it's not necessary and, and, and to, to uh, connect us to the laws of Moses in that way, I think is a mistake. Uh, but we could uh, say, uh, did you ever take something that didn't belong to you? What about ha hatred? Did you ever hate anybody? Did you ever lose your temper, get angry? Did you ever get jealous? Did you ever get envious? So um, we can, we can uh, identify these uh, sins in people and make them admit they're, they're, they are a sinner, that they have sinned without necessarily referencing the Ten Commandments. Um, but it was, uh, it was uh, what uh, Paul is citing here, and Paul is saying that this is the purpose of the law. But don't forget, he's still talking to people who are uh, primarily, this is the Jewish religion. It's a sect of Judaism at this point in time. Gentiles are beginning to come into it. And, uh, and so the law still is being uh, flouted about by the Judaizers. So he has to address what is the real purpose of the law. The only thing that law can, can value in the law is, is that you'll understand that you're a sinner and that you, you need the Savior. Um, all right. Does anybody want to respond more before we go to the next verse? Uh, no, I think that was really good. I'm, I'm good to move forward. Okay. Let's go to verse 25 then. It says, but after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Uh, whose turn is it for, go first this time? Is it? It's Ben's turn. I did the last ben, one. Ben, this is a great verse here. Verse 25, Ben, what do you say? Well, I kind of said some things. I, I guess I kind of read ahead in my mind uh, when I responded previously. But, um, yeah, the, the law 
tell, t- teaches us not only that uh, it demands righteousness and it tells us what righteousness is and it shows us that we have a disease and that we, we, we need to be cured of. Uh, we have a, you know, incur- without Christ, without the great physician, we're, we're hopelessly incurable. Um, and, you know, and similarly, uh, like the law would tell us, it would, it would give you an idea of what God's will was without the Holy Spirit. But now, when you when you believe on Christ, you have the Holy Spirit, and you no longer need the law. The law doesn't. The law only pointed us to Christ. Uh, and uh, again, it, it, we have once you have the Holy Spirit, you don't need the law to know what God's will is. Um, you you are righteous, and if you're walking in the Spirit, you're a hundred percent righteous. And so you don't need a law. You put a law. You put a law under someone you don't trust. You know? Can you imagine? Uh, you know, you have a, if you imagine like a judge, for example, he's, you know, he has a judge, he's seeing deadbeat after deadbeat appear before him, uh, you know, nameless, faceless person, you know, he's judging uh, the person by the strict uh, standard of the law, very cold justice, kind of, you know, hits the gavel, he says next, waits for the next deadbeat to show up, he has really no mercy or care for these people. But then he comes home and he uh, sees his son caught in trouble or caught in sin, and his t- attitude is totally different. He wants to he wants to correct his son. He may have to discipline his son, but he, he does it out of love, uh, not out of justice, like the law is. And um, again, I think uh, that the law is, is is kind of designed for a number of reasons to show us how, what how righteous God truly is, and to know what what uh, what we're faced with if we don't uh, receive. A, a new birth, we're going to get strict justice under the law, um, whether it be law of conscience or law uh, under Israel. We're going to be condemned by the law, um, and that's why we need we need something that's greater than the law. And what's greater than the law is mercy, and Christ is mercy and grace and per- personified. Mm-hmm. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm going to read 25 in the Amplified, Brother Cripps. It says. Uh, um, But now that faith has come, we are no longer under the control and authority of a tutor or and disciplinarian. Mm. Yeah, so that's that that adds to it definitely. I definitely understand though how the King James puts it. And this is a verse that should fly in the face of anyone that is trying to put people back under the law. If you're talking to Hebrew rooter, it's way more complicated than that because they'd love to to uh, get into the Old Testament. They love to go back in the law. They love to say that God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and uh, forever, which we do not disagree on that point. He is the same. Uh, But they fail to see that God had different purposes for the Hebrew people than he does for us. So, Paul, this should wrap it up for people right here, verse 25. But after that, faith has come, which it has now through Christ. We are no longer under a schoolmaster. We're no lo- longer under schoolmaster. We're no longer under schoolmaster. How many other ways is there that Paul needs to say this so that people understand it? I, I, I have just, I, I don't know, but I, we understand it. Those people that are that believe in grace, we understand. Um, Brother Luke uh, uh, made a good point earlier to to draw this out a little bit and explain it. Uh, it's not for us. Uh, it's not even for the Hebrew people anymore. Now, you're talking about dispensationalists. They believe that there's, uh, uh, during the millennial reign, whether you're an amillennialist uh, or, or you think it's already happened or whatever your beliefs are, uh, they believe that we're going to go back under the law. Uh, again, it's some mixture of law and faith. Um, I, I don't understand how they can believe that either. Why would God send his son to fulfill the law and to put us under grace grace through faith, like Paul's saying here, and then, oh, well, uh, no one else has to do it, but all all the Jewish people have to go back under the law again. Um, They believe they're going to even start up the sacrifices again. Uh, the, The one sacrifice, and Paul makes this clear, the one sacrifice was made for all men. Sin entered through Adam, and then through one man, and then through one man, uh, uh, all sin was was uh, taken care of and paid for. And he gives us that with this imputed righteousness. So there's no need to go back under the law again. And and 
Uh, uh, Paul makes it clear in verse 25, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. I think that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yes. Amen. Uh, well, as I said, Paul is really our champion for uh, uh, faith alone. I mean, we, we see this throughout the Gospel of John also, where it says that you save by believing, save by faith, uh, and nothing else is mentioned. So we have to assume that, well, if it just says believe and it doesn't mention anything else, it's got to be believing alone, faith alone. But Paul takes a step further and he actually puts it in writing. It says, it's faith alone. Therefore, we conclude a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So um, uh, he really uh, ratchets it down and tightens it so it's inescapable. It, it, it's impossible for you to add faith and works together or else you've run the gospel. It has no saving power for you. Uh, but let's go back to verse 10 for a second. It says, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Uh, let me look at it in the Amplified verse 10. It says, uh, um, for all who depend on the law, that is seeking justification and salvation by obedience to the law and the observance of rituals are under a curse. So um, this chapter, the whole book of Galatians, but this chapter here, we're, we're seeing very clearly that Paul is saying that if you want to add law or works to the gospel, you are putting yourself under a curse. Uh, and then he, when he gets down to verse 25, uh, it says, but after, now it says in the KJV, it says, but after that faith is come. Now I like the way that's phrased. I don't know if it's intentional to make the point that I, I'm trying to emphasize, but it says, but after that faith, I thought, well, that gets back to what I said in the earlier verse when I said, before faith came, I said, well, what does that mean? I think it should mean should be stated before the faith came. And it, it was, it was uh, uh, backed up by the uh, Young's literal translation, before the faith came, before Christianity came, uh, before the gospel came and was clarified to us, you know, and then uh, we were, uh, this law was in effect in order to teach us our need for the Savior to come. Um, but it says in verse 25 in the KJV, it says, but after that faith, now maybe I'm reading too much into it, but when it says, but after that faith, I'm happy it's there because I can say it's referring to the faith of, of Christianity. It's not the, the fact that that faith finally, finally came into existence, as we said earlier. Faith has always been the means of salvation. So what does it mean by that faith? The faith that, that saves us is, is our understanding of and believing in the gospel. Uh, so, But it says we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So we're not under the law uh, because we, we understand that the law served its purpose. And... Uh, uh, also, when I look at the Young's literal on the 20, verse 25, it says, and the faith having come. Again, uh, when it says the faith, uh, I think that is very important, that word the. I don't know what uh, word. It's not an adjective. Are you referring to, uh, it's an article. Um, it's an article. Are you referring to Galatians 3.23 where it says, but before the faith came? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I got down the wrong verse. On verse 25, I meant to go back to that. Thank you, Ben. But it says, oh, after, that faith. That, yeah. after yeah. that faith, after that faith, okay, what faith? That faith that we've been told, telling you about, the faith in Christ is your Savior. And then when we look at 25 in, the, in Young's literal, it says, and the faith having come. So it doesn't say, and faith having come. In other words, uh, a dispensation to say was see now now you're saved by faith faith finally came we're all finally in the in, in the in the in the dispensation of the grace of God now you finally people can get saved by faith without works no but this says and the faith having come that means the the faith of 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 Christianity the, the all of us who are Christians what is our faith what do we believe the tenets of Christianity is what this is referring to. Once the tenets of Christianity have been laid out, now that has come, we're no, no longer under 
the law uh, as a schoolmaster. We we don't need it as a schoolmaster. All right. Uh, any more from before we go to the next verse? Okay, let's go to 26 in the KJV. It says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Okay, Brother Cripps. Well, that's a, that's a short one, but it's an important one. For ye are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. That's important to understand. Um, and, it, and it's very true. When, when Christ came, uh, he gave us the, um, the option to be adopted as sons of God, which makes us the children of God. And as we've talked about before, this is not the, the kind of uh, obscure, larger, general sense of children of God, because in that way, you could say that everyone created as a child of God. Uh, if you're talking about the fact that he uh, made us, he created us. Uh, no, this is a this is a family oriented children of God uh, because we become adopted into the family of uh, of God through Christ. So, uh, you know, it's short, but it's important. Understand that we are we are children of God, and the mechanism is faith in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Let me look at it in uh, the uh, amplified. Ben, it says. Uh, for you who are born again have been reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, sanctified, and are all children of God. That is set apart for his purpose with full rights and privileges through faith in Christ Jesus. Yeah, Crips touched on this, but I, I cringe every time I hear it's usually uh, from a, a politician or a famous person uh, talking about usually when a tragedy strikes and tries to bring try to get the world to unite behind a cause. They always say, we are all children of God. Or if yeah. you know, there'd be a school shooting, it says, oh, they're all children of God. And um, no, uh, you couldn't be more wrong, actually. Um, people, God calls you either a son of God or you're a, a son of wrath or a, a, a son of disobedience. Um, you're either a slave or a son. And we all started off as slaves, slaves to sin. Um, and that's yes. why we need to redeem from, from that slave market. And become yeah. adopted, as Crip said, as sons. Um, just that John uh, one twelve says, it says, but as many as received him, uh, to them he gave the right to become the sons of God to those who believe in his name. Mm. Um, and again, it's just it, the escape of from becoming a, a son of a son of wrath, a son of disobedience, a child, a son of darkness, and uh, to a son of light, an adopted son, a son of God is to believe on Christ. Amen, Ben. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think it is an important point that you made in that uh, um, people misuse this uh, concept, uh, a child of God, uh, is it, applying it to every person living or ever, every person ever born is a child of God. Uh, but we know that's not the case. Um, uh, a child of God is someone who is born from above. And that's why in the Amplified, it, it does a very good job of amplifying. If if anybody's listening now and you don't understand this, listen, listen very carefully here. It says, to be a child of God, this is what it, 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 a child of God is. For you who are born again have been reborn from above. That is spiritually transformed, renewed, sanctified, and are all children of God that is set apart for his purpose with full rights and privilege. How? Through faith in Christ Jesus. So because of our faith in, in Jesus uh, as our Savior, uh, that's, that's the means by which we get this uh, new birth. We're born as a child of God spiritually. Spiritually, we're born, the uh, Bible says, born ab from above. It's a spiritual birth where our spirit is brought to life, united with the Holy Spirit of God, who in, uh, comes into us and permanently lives in us now, brings our spirit to life. That happens when we put our faith completely in Jesus Christ for our salvation. No. Uh, but if you have not done that, are you a child of God? Do you think of yourself as a child of God? I, I really am sorry. I, I hate to be the one to, to break this news to you. 
that only those people who have put their faith in Jesus Christ are children of God. Everybody else, there is a verse in the Bible, and there's more than one that could, to prove the point, but there's one particularly that, said, that says that uh, if when you're not born again, you are a child of the devil. And I, I know it's harsh. It may sound mean-spirited. It may, it may sound uh, just uh, really unfair, uh, but I cannot... I cannot uh, back off of what the scriptures clearly state. When we're born from our mother's womb, uh, uh, we, we're born wrong. We, we need to be born again because the first birth from our mother's womb, born wrong. We're, we're born with a dead spirit where we have a living soul, which is our mind, and, and uh, we have a, a living body, but our spirit is dead. That's what the scriptures say. We are, have a dead spirit that needs to be quickened. That means brought to life, regenerated, brought to life. And that happens when we put our faith in Jesus. The spirit of God comes in us, brings our spirit to life. And that and that is the new birth. And uh, that is what makes you a child of God. Unless you've put your faith in Jesus, you're not a child of God. I'm sorry. You need to be born again. All right. Amen. We need to be born again. Yeah. I think uh, too is that I think there's a, a verse in Acts that calls that Paul says that we are all offspring of God, uh, and he's talking talking in, in we're offspring in the sense of being in a creation sense. He's our creator, but not really our father. You know, um, and so the, but but uh, again, when you're born again in righteousness from above, it, uh, Scripture always makes a distinction that you're a son of God. You know, so. Being an offspring is not the same as being a son of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, if you can find that verse, uh, let me know where it is. Or read it to me because I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, um, okay, I'll find it. I might, uh, if I hear it, I'll probably then recognize it, but I don't, I can't, I don't know what one you're referring to. Um, all right, let's, uh, let me see. We've all responded to verse 26, right? So let's go to 27 in the KJV. It says, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Mm, there you go, Ben. Mm. There's your John verse. Yeah. Brother, Brother Ben, verse 27. He's probably busy looking for that verse I asked him for. Now. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have it up. Um, it's Acts 17, 28. It says... For in him we live and move and, ha and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are all we are also his offspring. Mm -hmm. So it's Acts 17, 28. Mm -hmm. and, and then 29, he says, therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if, if anybody can find the verse that I'm referring to where it says that uh, call someone a child of the devil uh, let me let me know where that verse is I can't I'm, I, it's hard for me to look for something because I'm afraid I'll lose my page that I'm, re I'm reading off of yeah, don't <laughs> okay, do that. I gotta set it up all over again no, we need you right where you are brother okay, okay. Uh, so um, let me read uh, did you uh, okay 27 yeah. I can yeah, 27, we're at 27? Yeah. Okay, so uh, for as many of you who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Well, um, you know, in the garden, we there was the God, the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil. And anyone who tries to go back to the law is really just biting and eating from the tree of good and evil again. That's all they're doing. That's why we need to, you know, that's why Christ was hung on a tree. He was hung on a tree. He's yeah. the fruit of the tree, essentially. And in a spiritual sense, you are what you eat. If you eat uh, you know, many of Christ's disciples were, uh, I think it's John 6, 60 or 666 or something like that, where uh, it talks about Judas betraying him and then many of his disciples could not take the hearings that he was saying about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Well, yeah. that's what we need to do because uh, we need to drink his uh, righteousness. and it, it becomes part of our very being. So and the word baptized means... Uh, in, in, in its strictest sense, really means to be identified with. So, for example, I mentioned this before, is that when you hear the word baptized in the Bible, you got to ring the word out in your mind because it doesn't always mean wet. 
uh, more often it means uh, to be identified with. And, um, and so, for example, the uh, uh, the Roman uh, soldiers, they would ha take hunting spears and uh, uh or they'd have they had to take hunting spears, then dip them in pig's blood, and when they did that, it became a hunting spear. Uh, so it, it became identified with uh, killing, essentially, and, uh, or killing man. And uh, so they dipped it in, in pig's blood. Um, there's a number of examples like that, but uh, baptism was a, a common uh, practice back then, but also a common understanding that it meant to be identified with. And so this verse is not teaching water baptism. Uh, in fact, it talks about putting on Christ. So he wore your sin, and if you believe that, you be you uh, you become you wear his righteousness. So you become inextricably linked with his identity and his righteousness. And uh, this is a great verse. I, it's one of my favorite verses because in, in Christ, in God standing, you have put on Christ, just like uh, Jacob um, uh, wore uh, Esau's um, clothing <coughs> to, to fool his father. So you got you cheated the law essentially. It's like Jacob was a deceiver, a cheater. You cheated the law by becoming by repre being represented uh, to, in receiving the blessings without being who you actually are. You, you're taking on a new identity. He got, in fact, he heard his voice, but he smelled and felt uh, Esau. And so uh, I think God hears our voice, but He sees and feels and smells Christ. Amen. Okay. All right. Let me, uh, did, uh, did we read that in the Amplified? I lost my, I was looking at the oh. chat room. Oh. Okay. Let me look at in the, in the Amplified verse 27, uh, Crips, it says for all of you who were baptized into Christ, into a spiritual union with the Christ, the anointed, have clothed yourselves with Christ. That is, uh, you have taken on his characteristics and values. Wow. Uh, ben didn't even read the Amphite and what he said. Uh, uh, did a really good job of explaining that. I, I really can't add much more to it except to say that um, even the verse, uh, I believe it was John that uh, uh, Ben read uh, earlier, uh, says the same thing. So this isn't the only place where we can find this about what happens uh, for us uh, through Christ or baptized into Christ, we put on Christ. Um, you know, there's the, there's the idea uh, versus uh, taking out of context of saying that we need to be holy as he is holy. Well, how do we do that? Well, we're baptized into Christ. We put on Christ. We're crucified with Christ. Um, it's, it's as if uh, we're up there on the cross too. I, I'm, I'm saying metaphorically because no one went through the pain uh, that Christ went through. None of us. There's not one person alive that had to go through uh, the pain and torture that, that he went through. And uh, on top of that, taking upon himself all the, the, the pain of all the sin uh, in the world, uh, past, present, and future. So no one has experienced that. But we're uh, it's like we're crucified with Christ. We're no longer that dead uh, zombie flesh uh, person anymore. And as Ben said, uh, we're, we're no longer slaves then. We're no longer slaves uh, uh, to, to sin. Uh, Paul says, and, and I, I forgive me for not knowing where it's at, but Paul says we're now slaves to righteousness. Uh, but he doesn't treat us like slaves. He treats us like children because that's what we are to him. We are his children. So we put on put on Christ, and that's how we're able to be holy as He is holy. Uh, it's not from anything that we do. We don't we don't have the capability to be holy as He is holy without the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and that's what we get with the Spirit of Christ uh, within us, and that's how we live. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, all right. Um, I have a playlist uh, titled Words Have Meanings. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I had spent quite a bit of time, uh, many hours, uh, defining words that should be not be so, uh, it shouldn't be necessary. I, I even did a video talking about believe defined. I had to define what believe means because particularly Calvinists, but many people, 
uh, they'll um, a word doesn't suit their purpose as far as their false doctrine, so they have to come up with a different definition. They'll use the same words we use, but they have a different definition in their mind. Um, so uh, it is important to um, know what the words mean. Um, and there are a few words like uh, saved. It doesn't always mean saved from, uh, you know, the second death. It could be mean, being saved from, uh, you know, a, a soldier's spear or something, or saved from starvation, or um, a, a, a baptize. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean water necessarily. As a matter of fact, you should not assume that it means water at all unless it states that it's water in the verse or the surrounding verse the context tells you clearly that it's talking about going into the water. Uh, if it doesn't clearly uh, state that it's water, then you should assume it's not water. It's a spirit baptism. Right. And that's the case in, in this in this verse here. And if, when we read it in the Amplified, it, it it's I think it states it quite well here. Um, it says for all of you who were baptized into Christ. That is, into a spiritual union with the Christ. So they're interpreting as a spirit baptism. Um, now, there's a verse, uh, I think it's Acts uh, 2.38, if I remember correctly, that the uh, baptismal regenera regeneration uh, doctrine people use to uh, support their belief that you, you have to get wet to get saved. Yeah. Um, you're regenerated, your spirit's brought to life, you're born again only when you get st stuck under the water. Yeah. Um, but uh, Dave Geisler did a good teaching on it, and I think he's got it correct. And, and when, when he says in the KJV and, and other translations, they, they use the word baptize uh, when the, the word, well, well, first of all, let me ask you, what does it mean to be baptized when we're referring to water? What actually happens? Uh, you're you're dunked under the surface. Okay, and when you're dunked under the surface, what's another word for when you go under the under the water? You are submerged, immersed, immersed, uh. immersed. Okay, uh, so really, the 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 word that we really should be using instead of baptize is immersion. We mm. are immersed uh, into Christ. Mm. Um, if we if we think of it as immersion rather than baptism, then we don't think necessarily it's got to be water because immersion could be believing into Christ, as it says here. Sure. For all of you who were baptized into Christ. Now, I asked Ben uh, a few weeks ago to add a couple of um, kind of uh, truisms to our list that we are uh, promoting. Uh, as we open up each one of our Church programs, we have all these truisms showing on the screen. Maybe there's truisms on the screen right now as we speak. I don't know. We're not right now. But uh, if you look at these true, yeah, it says Jesus is the eternal God, manifest in the flesh is the Son of God. So as you look at these truisms that come on the screen, there's there's one that we've, two that we've added recently. Uh, and one is, we believe into Christ. And the words in, word into is capitalized. I want to emphasize the word into because uh, we'll all agree. Well, we, can we all agree that we believe in Christ? And, and, and um, we could even say we believe on Christ. Okay. What does it mean to believe in Christ? It means, well, I believe in his uh, deity. I believe in his ability to save me. I believe in his faithfulness to keep the promise of salvation to me. Um, believing on Christ uh, I, I believe on him and that I'm depending on him. I'm relying on him. I have confidence on him to, to do what he said he'd do. Uh, but really, uh, believing, when we believe it for, to get saved, we are believing into Christ. We are being immersed into Christ through faith. And that's the way it's kind of expressed here in the Amplified. It says believing or uh, baptized into Mm -hmm. So being immersed into Christ, that's what happens. Oh, I am in Christ, Christ is in me, the Bible says. Mm -hmm. So, Amen. all right, uh, let me see. Is that all there is to the verses? Verse 27, uh, put on Christ. Yeah, I never heard that uh, illustration using uh, um, well, Isaac. Uh, it was Isaac to put on the, the animal skin, right, brother? 
I I, I get that messed up. I thought it was uh, uh, uh that was Jacob and Esau. No, no, it was no I Isaac and Esau and Jacob. Jacob oh, was, was that's right. That's Israel, right. Yeah, Israel. Jacob, yes, thank you. Israel. Uh, yeah, but uh, so um, no. Let me see. Abra no, Abraham had Isaac and and. Uh, and there were uh, Isaac, his brother was um, uh, Ishmael. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Isaac had um, Jacob. Yep. Jacob had Esau. Yeah. So it was Jacob and Esau. Okay. It was a ship Esau. Okay. okay. All right. I have to kind of. But yeah, isn't it interesting? Uh, I thought that was, a, I love that. Uh, that came to me one time. I just read it. I think, wow, this is what, uh, what how God sees us. Um, it's almost in reverse, though, because, uh, you know, Jake, uh, uh, Isaac saw blessed uh, Jacob or Esau. He thought it was blessed J uh, Esau uh, by you know the you know Esau. I think is a clear picture of the flesh, uh, and then uh, Jacob is a more picture of the spirit. Um, mm -hmm. But he was a deceiver. You know, the spirit kind of it 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 uh, it's uh, it trumps it tr trumps justice. Mercy trumps justice. Um, and I think uh, you know the spirit trumps the law, um, or the flesh, I should say. So I think that's a, a real clear indicate that that uh, tape, uh, depiction in the Old Testament is a picture of of how we are born again, essentially. Our God, how how God sees us in, in, in terms of our righteous standing before His eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and putting on Christ. Also, another picture of this is uh, putting on the robe of righteousness. Uh, putting on the righteousness of Christ. Uh, the um, now there is a, a doctrine that was argued about uh, against uh, in the first few centuries, uh, as they're uh, you know debating and trying to clarify this Godhead, uh, and they wrote all these creeds. Um, they uh, they're talking about the, the the teaching that Christ was not really a man; he was just wearing. Uh, like the skin of a man, you know, it was like, um, that I've heard people say that it was like, he, you're, uh, you had, he was wearing flesh or something. I forgot how it, how that's phrased, but uh, it was argued as a heretical teaching because uh, they were denying the uh, full um, um, uh, humanity of Christ. In other words, they're saying that he, he's truly God, but he wasn't really man. He was just wearing, like, wearing the skin of, of a man, you know? Right. Um, so um, putting on Christ, uh, uh, in, in that way, though, I think uh, the idea of the robe of righteousness is a valid, uh, you know, point, a valid uh, picture of this, putting on Christ. Absolutely. And there's a lot of references in Revelation about wearing white robes, and I believe that white robe is a picture of Christ's righteousness. Mm. Okay. All right. Let's go to verse 28 in the KJV. It says, uh, uh, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is either male nor female for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Well, there it is right yeah. there. Verse 28. Mm -hmm. um, this is another clarifying verse to me. It, it should should make it clear that there's no difference at all. We're all one in Christ Jesus, regardless of. He mentioned several things here: uh, Jew and Greek. There's no bond or free, uh, male or female. We're all one. So uh, that makes it pretty clear. Um, there, there's not one person that's better than another. Uh, we're not different. Uh, than uh, uh, being um, uh, Gentiles, we're not any different in that in in that sense uh, in the body of Christ than the Jews are. They're not better. We're not better. We're the same. Whether a person is uh, free or slaves, and I can go on a diatribe about how in the, this world has made us slaves in many ways. So uh, not in in the terms that I, I think it was meant back then. You know, uh, slavery uh, ran rampant back then. I, I'm sure we're all aware of that. Um, but the point is, regardless of our status or our station in life, regardless of our uh, uh, sex or gender, uh, we're all one in Christ. We're, and, and he did the, the 
two verses above that are talking about being children of God. Um, verse 26 is telling us we're children of God. Verse 27 tells us how we're baptized uh, in Christ. We put on Christ. And then this one is saying that we're all one in Christ. There are three, three verses, one after the other, that set this up for us to make us understand uh, our identity. I think it's wonderful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, brother. Uh, let me read verse 28 in the Amplified, uh, brother Ben. Um, there is now no distinction in regard to salvation, neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you who believe are all one in Christ Jesus. No one can claim a spiritual superiority. Well, we, we saw an example of uh, this. I, I think most people would never argue that, uh, you know, ethnicity doesn't play into salvation whatsoever. However, even to this day, I see um, delineations or um, uh, segregation in, in the churches uh, where there'll be a primarily black church or a primarily white church or any other uh, ethnicity. And I, I know there's, you know, demographics and things like that. And there's different communities that are primarily one ethnicity over the other, but uh, I see that even within uh, towns and, and things like that that are uh, you know fairly well integrated, uh, that there's the churches themselves are still fairly segregated, um, and that that's a shame. I mean that that it's absolutely shameful. Um, and even uh, you know Paul had to say Peter right to his face that uh, he was acting inconsistently with the gospel uh, because of the men of J- men from James and that they were the Jews were. Uh, choosing to um uh sit not you know sit with each other the jews would sit, jewish believers would sit, sit together and the gentile believers would sit together um and even in genesis there's a, i i found a, a an, an analogy where uh the joseph when he invited his brothers uh when they he had not yet yet revealed his identity to them or he was about to reveal their identity to them he uh sat his brothers uh, separately and the egyptians separately because the Egyptians thought it was detestable or an abomination to sit with uh, these Asiatics or Hebrews. Um, and again, I, th- I think that's a clear uh, parallel to uh, what happened in Acts and, and what Paul had to do to rebuke Peter to his face. Um, and I see it even today. Um, and it, I, I, it's, a real, it's a real shame. In fact, you know, I, I think we should really only care about the welfare of each other as believers way much, way more than any uh, political or national or ethnic boundaries, and yet I see it uh, still going on today, um, even uh, even among people that should know better and uh, are I, I consider real true brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. Man, well, uh, when I first read this verse, the first thought that came to my mind was, "Wow, too bad, Sister Renee is not here." <laughs> this is a verse I know she'd like to talk about. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a very important verse for her and for all, all of the sisters uh, that uh, are teaching and have a, a prominent uh, uh, role in, in our congregation that um, uh, that are not being uh, held down or held back uh, because they're female. Um, so this is an important verse for that. And uh, Now, when we read it in the Amplified, it makes this distinction about uh, being pertaining to salvation. It says, there is now no distinction in regard to salvation, neither Jew nor Greek. Let me pause there. Uh, this part is very important, uh, and I'm glad that they, uh, they uh, expounded or amplified that point there. They say, in regard to salvation, uh, because there is a faction quite well, we, we talk a lot about dispensationalism and it can't, it can't be avoided. I'm sorry. I know that we have, uh, you know, a variety of people in our congregation um, and um, there are, are degrees and ranges of dispensationalism. So some people maybe in the congregation right now listening, maybe you uh, identify yourself as some kind of a dispensationalist. But if you're a dispensationalist that that believes that 
uh, in times past or in some point in the future that the method of salvation is is no longer faith alone, but it is a combination of faith and works, then uh, that's the people I'm talking to right now. And that's the people that, that the Amplified Translation is, is um, um, uh, refuting in, the, in their translation here. It says, there is now no distinction in regard to salvation, neither Jew nor Greek. In other words, the dispensationalists, some were teaching that the Jews get saved differently than the Greek, the non-Jew. That the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, for example, they're not... You can't get saved from from anything in those, according to the hyper dispensationalists. They they say that that that's the gospel of the kingdom. That's the good news that Jesus is going to establish a kingdom, a future kingdom for the Jewish people, uh, and it's and, and that's not how people get it. Uh, and now for us though to get eternal life and go to heaven, uh, it's the gospel of the grace of God. Well, I'm sorry. There, it also says there's only one gospel. Mm-hmm. You know, there, there, there's one gospel, and uh, and it's uh, this, the, the grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone is the gospel, and and uh, so this point here about uh, being there's no Jew or Greek and uh, regarding salvation, it means that whether you're a Jew, and that's talking about the people that uh, Jesus was talking about talking to, the people that Paul's talking to here, the Jewish believers. Uh, uh, or people today, uh, if you're a Jew and you want to uh, get saved, uh, it's it's still the same. No difference between a Jewish believer and a non-Jewish believer. It's faith alone in Christ alone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and also says there is neither slave nor free. Uh, that doesn't really apply to us much today, thankfully. There is neither male nor female. This is an important distinction. But but does it does it mean then that that um, Males and females get saved the same, same way. Uh, did anybody ever teach that males and females got saved differently? No. I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of that. I've never heard of that teaching. No. So uh, I would have to say that it's not only talking about uh, th- th- there's no distinction between male and female regarding salvation. I think that this is some is even broader than just salvation. This is just the way God sees us in the church. He doesn't look and see what one person is a male or female. One person is a Jew or a Gentile. One person is slave or free. He sees us all as the same, as children. And uh, um, and for you who believe, we're all the same in the sight of God. And, and uh, of course, salvation is the same for everybody, too. And one in Christ. Uh, no one can claim spiritual superiority. Um, well, that was... That was a, a problem in that uh, the beginnings of the church, they, they, they were quite arrogant about their position uh, in being a Jew. Uh, in fact, uh, John the Baptist says, you, you think too much of your, uh, your ancestry, uh, you know, as far as descendant of Abraham, God can turn these stones into descendants of Abraham <laughs> to, to make them understand that that's, that's not what's important. Your genealogy is not what matters. Uh, it's, your, it's your faith. Um, all right. Any more on verse 28 before we go to the final verse? No, sir. All right. Let's go to verse 29 in the KJV. Uh, whose turn is it to go first? Uh, Ben's up for the last one. Okay. All right, Ben. It says, and if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Well, there you go. Um. I'd have to study this out, and I haven't um, yet. But when he says Abraham's seed, there, I, I'm assuming that that's uh, a singular seed. Uh, he's referring to Christ, and so you're in you're in Christ. It's another way of saying you're in Christ, essentially. Um, and it has nothing to do with your, your your ethnicity at all. A lot of people like to say, you know, they use doctrines of like, oh, well, your your serpent seed doctrine, for example. Uh, and I think that's ridiculous. I think that can be absolutely irrefutably uh, well, uh, debunked. Yep. Um, and I think it's a very carnal way of looking at scripture. And in fact, if you look at uh, every time I believe where scripture says you are a son of or a father of, it's usually referring to a spiritual, like you're reflecting that person's character. So we're sons of Abraham in the sense that we're reflecting his character. And in fact, 
the person that uses your the name that uses that you're a son of it's the first person in the bible that uh reflected that character so for example i think it says tubal cain was great with uh instruments of bronze and iron well it doesn't mean that everyone who's good with bronze and iron every blacksmith in the world is descended from him it just means that he he he's reflecting that first person's character uh and wow. same with um there's i think i believe in timothy P paul says to women in the church that if you don't fear your daughters of sarah so it's it's a conditional thing and it's, it's basically uh, are you going to uh reflect that person's character by behaving as they did are you gonna are you gonna uh take on those same attributes so i think this verse here is again just saying uh that uh if you're christ then uh you are you're, you're born you're born of abraham christ was you know abraham's descendant in, uh of the flesh but he was also uh of the spirit and uh only the spirit is going to be, be receiving the promises uh, only the sons of God will be, will be receiving the promises because a promise, only way God can keep his promises, it has, if it has no contingent, human contingent. Um, if, it's, if there's a human contingent, we will absolutely fail. And that's yeah. why there's no law that could give life. If there was, there would be such a law, but there isn't. Uh, because anytime you had a, a human factor involved, you can guarantee we're going to mess it up. And that's mm -hmm. why the only way God could promise something is to make it totally, absolutely dependent on him. Uh, and I believe again with this verse, it's kind of I think this verse is kicking off that theme of thought that Paul's going to expand on in the next chapter. Yeah, you, you almost became a preacher for a moment. That was wonderful. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Praise God. Uh, all right, Brother Cripps. Let me read that in the uh, Amplified verse uh, twenty-nine. It says, um, "And if you belong to Christ, that is, if you are in Him." then you are Abraham's descendants and spiritual heirs according to God's promise. Yeah, so this, this ties back into what I learned. I, I was saying that, I think it was last week, I, I learned uh, about this, the little difference with the seed thing. And I, I say little, I probably shouldn't use that word. To me, it's a big difference to understand who the promise was made to. I always thought it was, it was, it was made to the Jewish people, but, um, I agreed with what was being said, uh, and uh, it sounds like uh, Ben did too. Uh, so this is a new thing for me, but verse 29 backs it up. So he's, he said all this to say that we're in Christ. These verses above, we're children. Again, we're children of God by faith. Uh, we're baptized into Christ. We put on Christ. And then the point in verse 28 says neither uh, Jew nor Greek, so we're all one in Christ. And then he goes back to this idea. And if you be in Christ, which he, he's made a good point that we are, then you're Abraham's seed. And we are heirs. The promise wasn't wasn't to, to the people, uh, the, the uh, or, or rather the seed was Christ, not Abraham's seed. I understand that. So we're heirs according to the promise. Now, I did understand uh, what Ben pointed out about, uh, he, he makes an excellent point. Again, uh, about that, if you make uh, a covenant with a with a human, they're they're bound to fail, and that is why Abraham was asleep when this uh, promise was made. But we're heirs because we're in Christ. Christ is the seed. We're heirs because of that. We're adopted in the family, and by His grace, Lord knows I won't speak for anyone else, but I don't deserve it. But because of His grace, He's making me uh, a joint heir with Christ. Praise God. That is a, a fantastic and wonderful promise. And if it was made to human, if Abraham any part in, had any part in that, then as, as good as he was because righteousness was imputed unto him for belief, um, he would fail. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you. Uh, I, um, I think overall the Amplified is very helpful. Uh, but in this last verse, I have to say that I, I think that they have, um, they're not being consistent. Uh, they did a good interpretation. Um, the verse that you're referring to is verse 16, when it talks about seed rather than seeds. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and look at the way they interpret verse 16. It says, now the promises uh, in the covenants were decreed to Abraham and to his seed. God does not say, and to seeds that is descendants or heirs, uh, 
right. uh, as if referring to many persons, but as to one and to your seed who is none other than Christ. So here they did a beautiful job of explaining that verse 16 in the Amplified. And then we get down to verse 29. And uh, I think they, they, made, they made a mistake here. It says, and if you belong to Christ, that is, if you are in him, then you are Abraham's descendants. And it said, their translation in verse 16 says, no, it doesn't talk about referring. It's not referring to his descendants. Mm -hmm. It actually uses the word there. It says, it says, uh, as if referring to many persons, but as, uh, no, uh, and to seeds, that is descendants. In other words, if you're, if you think it means seeds instead of seed, then, then it's referring to de his descendants. Mm -hmm. And they say that uh, it's not seeds, it's seed. So it's yeah. not talking about his descendants. Right. And then they get down to 29 and they, they're saying that it, it is his descendants. Uh, so I think that they're, they're not consistent between 16 and, and 29 and what they did. But if we look at the KJV in verse 16, uh, it says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to his seed, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So, of course, that was very important when we did that study Mm -hmm. Last week or, or two, uh, uh, we uh, we made sure that everybody understood that. See, we we make a big deal of it, but that's because Paul's making a big deal of it. I would agree. Know? He's making a real big deal of it in verse sixteen. That way, don't think it seeds. I want you to understand it seeds singular. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, yeah, I think. Yeah, because. Go ahead. It works in conjunction with him saying, don't think too highly of yourself. Remember that? So, yeah, he, he's he's making a big point of it because there needs to be a point made of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, we finished chapter three and uh, right on right on schedule. So we've got about 90 minutes now. So let's uh, we started a few minutes late. So yeah. let's um, let's go ahead and start uh, summing up our thoughts here. Uh, uh, Brother Ben, uh, give us your uh Closing remarks and, and uh, what did you did you have a good time uh, uh, helping us tonight? Yeah, just give me a minute to pull up my britches. Um, Vernice <laughs> pants are big. Um, now I did my best, uh, but I'm no replacement for Renee. I know that, uh, but it, I definitely had a lot of fun and uh, always willing to step in and uh, add my two shackles. Uh, but you guys, uh, I, I got a lot from what you guys are mentioning. And uh, great catch at the last second there, Luke, about the seed. That's very interesting why they changed that. Um, but, yeah, gr great uh, great fellowship, great study, and looking forward to the next one. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, and uh, Brother Cripps, uh, what's your summary remarks? Yeah, yeah, so this is a, a good way to finish the chapter, and we'll see if the next chapter starts out with a continuing thought or whether he moves on to a different topic. I always find that uh, fun to see. Um, I, I'm not going to look ahead, so uh, that I'll be surprised uh, upon next Wednesday's reading. Uh, but, yeah, so there's a lot in, a lot in this. I, I loved how uh, Paul, again, makes these points about the law and uh, lets us know that it's you know through faith again. Um, someone in the chat said that they liked uh, Galatians because it's a, it's a good book for learning and understanding. I'm paraphrasing their comment. I think he said knowledge, but uh, same base concept. And I would agree. I've already learned uh, a few key factors, some things I understood before, but I've learned something already from Galatians. Um, and again, and, I, and people are probably getting tired of me uh, saying this, but I, I keep saying it because it means something to me. I am benefiting so much from these verse by verse readings and uh, listening to everyone's opinion. I definitely benefited from uh, uh, Ben's uh, opinions and always do. Uh, so uh, thank you, Ben, for uh, stepping in. I think you did a great job uh, uh, through the spirit, of course. And uh, it, it was it was wonderful and glad to have been a part of it again. And uh, I look forward to next week. And I'll just say. Uh, good night to everyone in the chat. Hope you guys have a great uh, weekend coming up and week, and um, I'll see you next week. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, I have said this many times, and Renee has, uh, has said the same thing. She's come to the same conclusion that um, 
if if, uh, if the, for some reason the Bible was going to be destroyed throughout the world, and and only uh, we it was up to us to save one book or two or three books. Which mm -hmm. books would we save uh, from extinction? We would choose the Gospel of John first, right? And then the next contender would be the next ones would be Galatians and Hebrews. Uh, I, I'm, 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 was really interested, in, and uh, I, it's always nice when when, when someone um, uh, comes to the same conclusion as I do. It makes me feel a little more confident that well, um, if he came to the same conclusion, it kind of strengthens my conclusion. But, uh, so they, they uh, decided the same thing. These are the three books that are. Uh, our favorites and most important, uh, we would say. Uh, and so here in Galatians, there is so much. In Galatians 1, I mean, it's so dramatic what's, what's going on. And then when we get to chapter 3, amazing chapter. It starts off, oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Oh, man, I mean, this is one of the most important uh, statements in the Bible. And, and then uh, we get down to the uh, other th parts of this uh, ch chapter that uh, were justified uh, by uh, faith uh, and uh, the points being made over and over again in this chapter, but it, and then it says uh, that uh, the law is just our schoolmaster. And then it says that the law is, um, we're no longer under our, uh, the schoolmaster because we're justified by faith. So, uh, uh, but, but, after that, faith has no come. We are no longer under a schoolmaster. So, I mean, there are some of the most important verses and concepts being uh, made in this chapter. So, uh, this chapter is it'd be worthwhile for everybody to listen again if you missed any part of it to go back and listen to it all. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so we'll we'll move to the next chapter. There's only six chapters in the book of Galatians, so we're halfway through now, and. Uh, uh, so we'll start with chapter 4, verse 1 next time. Uh, let me see if in the chat room, if there's anything important. Uh, for, all right. If, if you had anything important you want us to cover quickly before we say good night, go ahead and make a point now. But otherwise, let me just say it, um, we missed Renee, but uh, uh, I'm not sure if she'll be back for her program tomorrow or not. But keep an eye out. Uh, she'll probably make an announcement if uh, if she does not do her uh, Thursday throwdown program. Uh, she'll, I'm sure she'll let you know. But um, if, if she does it, make sure you join her for that. And then Friday, uh, of course, we have the church program, Fun Fellowship Friday. And it's so much fun. Brother Cripps, how much fun is it? It is super fun. It's super fun time on uh, uh, Fun Fellowship Friday. <sighs> yes. Uh, ben, how much fun do you have on Friday nights? Too much fun. Too much fun. We had to yeah. we had to stop early, otherwise we just have too much fun. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. actually so much fun. Be careful. You might get giddy. That's what happens to me. I get giddy quite often on Friday nights. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget, join us on the same channel here, Church of the Eternally Secure, Friday at nine thirty p.m. Eastern time. All right. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.